what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives, much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard. As we mature in Christ, our lives gradually begin to look more like His. The strength of His character and the beauty of His Spirit become our own. The same transforming love that was in Him gradually cultivates a life of holy fruitfulness in us. This fruitfulness is not something we develop. It is something that is developed in us as we yield daily to the power of His Spirit working within. Friends, I want to encourage you to turn with me, please, to the book of Galatians. We're going to be in Galatians chapter 5 in just a little while. Today, we're going to do this a little differently. We're going to move toward the text that will be the anchor of our study together. There is much to say on the way there to prepare our minds and hearts for what it says when we finally arrive. So if you're ready... Uh, when we get there at Galatians chapter 5, then we'll be ready together. But before we get there, I got I to gotta tell you about somebody. Now, some of you, if you've been in Johns Creek for a while, if you've been at Johns Creek Baptist Church for a while, you know my friends Joe and Betty Pugh. You've heard me talking about Joe and Betty Pugh for a long time. Joe and Betty are make-up people, made-up, they're eponyms, they're eponymous figures, symbolic figures, they're you. They are who the pastors think about every time we do anything at all, anytime we plan a sermon, a program, an event, a Bible study, a gathering, a song. We think about Joe and Betty Pugh, and Joe and Betty become the lens through which we view and do everything here in the church. But even if you know Joe and Betty, you may not know something about them. I wonder if we might talk just a little bit about Joe and Betty, because I believe if we know something about Joe and Betty, we might know something about this text that's going to come to us in just a few moments. Because what you might not know is that Joe and Betty grew up in this church. In fact, they were born in the cradle roll of this church. They were, they were children in our children's program. Take a look. There's Joe, little Joe, Joey. He used to be called Joey and, and Betty. And they grew up here. They, uh, they were part of our preschool program. They were exposed to the love of Jesus through those who change diapers and rock them into comfort when they are distressed and they came up through our children's ministry. Take a look. There they are in our children's ministry. They sang in Beth's children's choirs. They, they gathered for a vacation Bible school. They, they went through passport kids, and they studied all the things that we want our kids to study as they become aware of Jesus. In fact, we, we dedicated them when they were very, very small on this stage. Their parents, Joe and Betty, uh, they, their parents raised them to believe in Christ. So they became part of our youth ministry. There they are. Hair's a little longer. They're doing all the things that we do with our student ministry. They go to camp. They went to Passport. They do Disciple Now. They come together on Sunday nights for the Sunday night small groups. They do the thing. This Joe and Betty, little Joe, little Betty, growing up now. And they're kind of becoming fond of each other. Look at them. Because they fall in love. They fall in love, Joe and Betty, and soon they get married. And they got married right here in this church. They got married here. They were baptized here. They fell in love here. They got married here. And you know what happens after you fall in love and get married. If all things work out right, well, first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes little baby Joe and Betty in a baby carriage. They raised their, their own babies here, and they committed themselves to do that. They, you know what they did? They raised their children in church. 
They insisted. Here's a picture of them on the way to church. There's Joe and Betty. Now they have the kids. They're, they're a little bit older now. Now is where the kids are starting to pitch a fit. I don't want to go to church. Well, you're going to church, you know. I don't like this dress. I don't like this tie. Where well, you're going to put it on. You're going to go to church. Get yourself in the car, you know. And they did the thing. And for a long time, they came to church and they did what we do. We grow in Christ. We, we grow in our understanding of who he is and what he requires of us. And it wasn't always easy, Joe and Betty. They, they went through some things together. Sometimes there was sickness. And then there was the overcoming of the sickness. Sometimes there was trouble and the overcoming of the trouble. And they rose and they fell and they failed. And God picked them back up. And they learned through their life together as they raised their children to walk by faith and not by sight. And they kept on growing and kept on growing. And then they became 105 years old. Look at them. They look pretty good for 105 years old, right? We, we raise them well here at JCBC, strong. I had to make it 105 because about 10 years ago, I said they were 95, but they have aged. And I had to make sure Joe and Betty were older than Fred. <laughs> so, <laughs> right? So they're 105 years old. And here's the thing about Joe and Betty. You got to understand this. Now, here's what we do. I report some sad news. 105, long, ripe life. Sad news, both of them pass away peacefully in their sleep together. Same night. And we gather together at their funeral. That's what we do, see. We gather together at their funeral and both of them are here. And now, having known nothing but JCBC, having been exposed to nothing but the God who was introduced at JCBC, we get an opportunity to hold these two lives back up to God at their funeral with one question in mind, how did we do? God, how did we do? They were here from the beginning until their very ending. How did they do while they were under our care? And everything that the pastor's plan in ministry here is in service to that end, in cultivating something in Joe and Betty that at the end allows us a sense of contentment when we hand them back to God. Are you pleased, Lord? You know, I think it was David Brooks who talked to us about the difference between resume virtues and eulogy virtues you know there's a difference between resume virtues and eulogy virtues resume virtues are those virtues that we write down on paper in order to impress others and, and land a job here's where i've been this is what i've done here are the degrees that i've earned our resume virtues are a projection of all the best parts of us so that those who we're trying to impress will give us their attention eulogy virtues are different. Eulogy virtues, well, that's, that's the stuff they say about you at your funeral. I wonder which set of virtues we spend the better part of our lives developing. When I think about Joe and Betty, I hope that we are a church that allows them at the end of their life to present God with a set of qualities and characteristics and traits that have been cultivated in them over the years. And I wonder if we might do something a little different than we normally do in church, in worship, during the sermon. Usually one guy's doing most of the talk, and I wonder if you could help me here. Sitting right where you are, I wonder if you were to think about Joe and Betty at the end of their 105 years of living, having gone through all that we have taught them and cultivated in them in, in their faith, what are some of the eulogy virtues we hope are developed in them by the time they go back to God. For example, I want them to be biblically literate. Amen. I want them to be theologically mature, thoughtful, respectful. I wonder if anybody might just throw out a few more adjectives. What do we want them to be like when we give them back to God? Christ-like. What else? Loving. Come on. Com uh, kind compassion. Somebody said back here, grateful, respectful. Yeah. You know, the pastor might even say generous. <laughs> I 
But at the same time, everything that you're saying, if we gathered all those qualities, all of those traits together and held them up to God, you know what? The one word or the one hyphenated word that says it all was said very first in the very back. I heard it. Christ-like. That is everything. We pray that by the end of Joe and Betty's life, they have become Christ-like because that is the chief aim of everything we do here. And why? Because that's the end game of the Christian life. I want you to remember what I'm about to say here. Let it kind of sink in because it is the pivot point of this entire new sermon series. The chief aim and the end game of the Christian Christ-like life is becoming more and more and more like him every day that we live, to live our lives so yielded to the power of God's spirit and love working through us that by the end of our lives, we reflect the very character of the God that we see in the face of Jesus. Now, I know that was a lot of words, But I'm going to say it again so it sinks down into the soil of your soul. The chief aim and the end game of the Christ-like life is to become more and more and more like him every day that we live. To live with such a yieldedness to the power of God's love working through us that by the end of our lives, we reflect the very character of the God that we see in the face of Jesus. That's it. That's the goal for Joe and Betty and for me and for you. I wonder if you've ever thought about the fact that maybe your chief aim in this life is not what you thought it was. It's not what people told you it ought to be. It's not the pursuit that you went out and madly searched because somebody told you you ought to search out this pursuit. What if the chief aim in the end game of your life is to become more and more like him every day that you live? This is why. In the book of Colossians, we read this wonderful verse. Listen to these words. He is the one we proclaim, Jesus admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. What would happen in your life if you changed the chief aim and the end game of your life to simply become more and more and more mature in Christ until the end of your life when people look at you, they don't know if they're looking at you or looking at Jesus himself. I want that for you and I want that for me. So here's the question. When you think about your life right this minute, were you more Christ-like a year ago or today than you were a year ago? Let me put it another way. When you think about where you are right now in your spiritual journey, are you more Christ-like than you were one year ago today? And another way to ask that question may be, when you think about one year from today, will you be more Christ-like than you are today? Because that is the chief aim And the end game of everything that we're doing. And that's what our goal is for every Joe and Betty who walk onto this campus, who come on to our radar screen, who walk into the consciousness of our minds and the and the and the the space that we provide in our hearts for one another. The fact is everybody knows a Joe and Betty. Everybody. Everybody knows the old version of a Joe and Betty who have been cultivated over years and years and years to become more and more and more like Christ. Let me just ask you the question. Have you ever been with someone and in their company, you just didn't want to leave? I mean, think about who they are and the kind of life and aura and, and, and environment, the kind of vibe they bring into the room. Have you ever been with someone who was so steady in their mind and so stable in their hearts that it brought a kind of peace to you without even saying a word? But Laura and I know a couple like that. We went to visit them in Orlando for a couple of days this week with our, our sons. They were in town. We went down and, and David and Mary Harding are good old friends of ours. I should say long-term friends of ours. 
not old friends, Dave, Mary, but they're long-term friends. And, and the fact is, when we are with them, we, we don't want to leave. And you know why? In their presence, now follow me, there is a centeredness, a kind of compassion, a clarity. There's a kind of presence that is fully present and non-anxious. There's a kind of perspective that comes. There is a kind of love in the room. I might even say it this way. There's a lightness of being, but also a gravity of soul. Do you know somebody like that? And you're with them, and they've been through it. They've been through some things. they got some scar tissue to show it, and yet when you're with them, you're like, I just feel better about me. I just, I just don't want to leave this space because I feel a little healthier when I'm in the space that you're occupying. Do you know somebody like that? Because here's the trouble with knowing somebody like that. I mean, you know, you walk into the room and these are the kind of people and you have them in your family, you have them in your friend's circle. You walk into a room and these are the kind of people who, they bring the anxiety of the room down rather than up. They're the kind of people who bring perspective when you have spiraled into some kind of chaos. In other words, they're Christ-like. But the trouble with knowing Christ-like people, (laughs) the trouble with spending some time with Christ-like people is that you and I are sometimes prone to believe a lie. We are prone to believe, oh my goodness, They are so Christ-like. They are so centered and anchored. They're so full of the the fruit of God's love that they must, I don't know, have access to something I don't have access to. There must be something that they know that I don't know. They must have the access code, the secret formula. They must have the secret sauce, and and I don't know it. I don't have that, and maybe they do. But the trouble is, it's not usually the kind of access code that we think it is. Because nine times out of ten, when you're with somebody who has a gravity of soul, a lightness of being, a kind of Christ-like presence, it's possible to think to yourself, man, i got to try a lot harder. They know something I don't know, and maybe what I need to do is just do some more stuff that makes me Christ-like. That's what I need to do. I need to do one more Bible study. Maybe I need to do one more prayer. I need to take on a a whole new set of practices. I'm just not doing enough. I'm not giving enough. I'm not supporting the church ministry enough. And that may be true, by the way. (laughs) But you get my point. No, the point being, I'm not doing something enough. And so maybe I got to step it up and throttle up. I need to go to a higher gear to do something that puts me in a right relationship with God so that somehow I have the kind of fruit in my life that I see in their lives. And I'm telling you, It is a trap. It is a lie because I want you to remember these words that are coming from my heart today. The secret, the secret to the Christ-like life is not found in striving, but in surrendering. Will you please just let that sink into your heart? The secret to the Christ-like life that is so full of fruit that people just want to want to sit in your presence and then soak it up. The secret to being so grounded and full of life is not striving for it. It's surrendering. It's so yielding to the power of God's love at work in you that God does something in you that you can't possibly do on your own. That's why. We call it fruit. Fruit. Fruit is something that is grown when the conditions in the soil are right. It's not about willing yourself to grow fruit. It's not about hoping and trying and and, 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 and making every effort to grow the fruit that others may may see in your life. That's That's like fake fruit. I remember when I was a kid, we... Remember, we used to put fake fruit. I don't know, you may, you, you may still have it on your coffee table. I don't want to offend. I just remember as kids, we went over to this house. When, I don't even remember who it was. And, you know, they had like a bowl of fake bananas and apples and oranges and stuff. And my brother, while he was still with us, he said, can I have an apple? And the, the person there said, sure. He takes the apple, that styrofoam thing, and he, he sinks his teeth into it. And I, I'm, I'm not kidding you. That thing stayed there for years afterwards with his teeth marks in it. 
Fake fruit is, is not as delicious, but we will do that. We will do that. We will prop up a life that we think through our efforts and our merits may somehow grow fruit. But that's not how it works. It doesn't come through striving. It comes through surrendering. And that's why the anchor verse of our entire series is Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. And it's familiar to you. It reads this way. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the kinds of fruits that grow out of the Spirit abiding in you. The trouble is we often think we can pop those fruits out of our lives by our own merit. And the entire focus of this series is about how to actually experience love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, not by striving, but by surrendering. And the truth is, Joe and Betty, ah, man, they won't know it unless they understand the background of what Paul is saying when he says that this fruit comes from the Spirit. So I wonder if we might take a little side detour and let me give you a little background, a little context behind this very familiar verse about the fruit of the Spirit or all these things. I wonder if I can tell you that the Christian movement, the entire Christian religion before it became a religion, began as a messianic movement within ethnic Judaism. Among ethnic Jews, there was a messianic movement. That means that they were looking for a Messiah, a uh, a kind of chosen person by God who would be set aside to not only liberate them from their oppressors, but to show them the way to live in alignment with the will of God in such a way that their lives are filled with fruit. That's their expectation in a Messiah. Set us free from our oppressors and show us the way. But they waited for the Messiah for centuries and centuries and generations came and passed. And in the meantime, God gave them a great gift. God gave them the gift of what we refer to as the law. You know the law given to Moses, Ten Commandments, followed by more than 600 other commands that are, in essence, a set of rules and regulations that are meant to help people live their lives in alignment with the will and the desire of their God. Do these things. Don't do these things. Eat this food and don't eat that food and mark your bodies in a certain way circumcision and the like, to to identify that you are a part of this group. Wear these kind of clothes and not those kind of clothes. Follow this calendar with this set of festivals and celebrations. And why? Because if you follow this set of rules, regulations, behaviors, things that you do, you will align your life in a way that stays in keeping with the will and the desire of God. In the beginning, the law was a great gift to the people because the law was like a, like a lens through which the people were able to see, is my life in alignment or out of alignment with the desires of God? Because if it's in alignment, great, fruitfulness will come. But if it's out of alignment, the law can provide a way for us to get back into alignment with God by doing these things, by avoiding these things. By behaving in these ways, by avoiding these behaviors, by wearing these clothes and not these other clothes and so on, right? And for a long time, this is why the rabbis called the law, the the Torah, a yoke, a gift that helps us chart our path to stay in alignment with God. But by the time Jesus shows up on the scene, something interesting has happened. By the time Jesus, who is the Messiah, shows up onto the scene, this law, this set of regulations, these rules had become something of a meritocracy. It had become a set of guidelines that you must do in order to be in a right relationship with God. A set of guidelines that if you do them, you're in relationship, and if you don't do them, you're out of relationship. And there were religious leaders like me 
who would take that to the, to the absurd level of perfection and holiness to where you could barely keep up with how perfect the law demanded your life look in this world. And so Jesus shows up as the Messiah sent to show the world with a human face, with a human life, what the way of God is meant to look like. And he was most frustrated, most frustrated with religious leaders who put a yoke on people that was too hard for them to bear. Nobody can live up to that level of performing and earning and achieving. So he said, let me show you the way. In fact, he said, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. No one gets to the Father but through me. And so here it is, a whole set of do's and don'ts that you presume will get you into right relationship with God. But Jesus said, no, 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 look, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one gets to the Father but through me. And often over our history, we have used that one verse as a kind of like bully passage, like a, like a bully verse to beat up on other religions. But the fact is that verse really has very little to do with other religions. That's another conversation that we could have at another time. What this verse has to do with is that I am the way, which means there is no way to earn your life into the heart of God by performance, by working harder, by achieving more. Look at me, I am the way. See the way that I live and love and lead and and welcome and embrace and forgive? That's the way. I am the truth. Listen to the words that I am preaching, he said, and live by them. I am the life. Pay attention to what I do and how I order my life and then live your life in alignment with my life and you will live. I am the way, the truth. So when he was crucified, do you realize That not only, oh man, this is good. At least I think it is. Not only was he crucified for your sins and for mine. Do you know that what was nailed to the tree that day was not just my sin and shame. But also what was nailed to that tree that day was every perceived pathway to the heart of God outside a relationship with Jesus. That means nailed to the tree was every meritocracy. Every attempt to earn your way, every attempt to live a fruitful life outside of him, nailed to that tree was all of the old patterns of humanity. So that when he was raised on the third day, do you know what was raised? Not just his body, and it was, quite literally, raised on the third day. But do you know what else was raised? The New Testament reminds us that what was raised on that third day was a new humanity a new way for us to exist with God, a way that is grounded in grace and not our works, a way that is made possible because of the goodness of God despite the evil in men's hearts. This is why in 2 Corinthians we read these fascinating words. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old, everything old, like Every pathway to get to God outside of him. Everything old, like, like trying to just do more, try harder, be better, do good. Outside of every other pathway, everything old has passed away. Behold, everything has become new. Yeah, 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 yeah. So when I'm talking to Joe and Betty... I'm trying to get them to understand it is possible to have a life of fruitfulness. It is possible to live with so much fruit, the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, that your life is teeming with fruitfulness, stability of mind, steadiness of heart, a non-anxious life in which we live content with what we have and not jealous about what we don't have. It's all possible, but not through striving. It's through the grace that has been given to us. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. When that good news, this is why we call it good news. That means God's crazy about you and there's nothing you can do about that. Nothing you can do to earn it. Nothing you can do to lose it. God is crazy about you. But by the time that good news, which I think is great news, reached the Mediterranean world, 
that news spread all across the Mediterranean world. And when it reached places like Galatia, different churches were formed in the area of Galatia. And by that time, you realize that there were just as many Christians following the Lord who were not Jewish as those who began Jewish. Maybe even in places more so. Which means that these who had come to Christ, those who had yielded their lives to him, surrendered their lives to him, were never given the yoke of having to wear the law. Never having to perform the meritocracy of good works. They were never told you have to be circumcised and then you have to wear these clothes and you can't eat bacon anymore. You know, there, there was no, there's no sense of having to give up that because they were free in Christ. Just like you and I are. But the trouble is, some of the old school cats back in Jerusalem who believed in the old way say, yeah, no, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Grace is good, but you first you've got to become one of us. You can't, you can't cut line. They were called the Judaizers. They were men who would go to these new Christians and say, it's great that you've come to Christ, but don't forget, there's some things you still got to do. You got to be circumcised. You got to eat these foods, obey this calendar, avoid these kind of behaviors, and yada, yada, yada. And by the time that gets around to Paul's ears, Paul flips a lid. Paul loses his mind. And he says, This is not, no, this is not how grace works. So I want to do something right now that we don't typically do in a Sunday morning during a sermon. I want to give you some uh, Galatians chapter 5. But by that, I mean, the whole thing. Listen to these words. With that in mind and with Joe and Betty in mind, prone to think that I got to keep doing something to earn God's love, listen now with that context in mind to what Paul says to Joe and Betty. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Listen, I, I, Paul, am telling you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. Once again, I, I testify to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obliged to obey the entire law. In other words, gosh, if you're going to be if you're going to do that, well, then you might as well quit eating bacon. You might as well not wear these clothes, and you might as well change your calendar you, because there's no winning in that. There's no grace in that. He picks up in verse 4. You who want to be reckoned as righteous by the law have cut yourselves off from Christ. You see what he's doing there? You've cut yourself off from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. And often we think that when somebody falls from grace, we think it's because they, they were loved by God. They were saved by God. They were given grace by God, but they've done some bad things. And so they've fallen by grace or fallen from grace. That's not what fallen from grace means at all. When we fall from grace, it means we fall away from remembering that it's all grace. That we don't have to earn this. That it was earned upon the cross. It was finished upon the cross. Verse 5, for through the Spirit... For the, through, the, through the Spirit, by faith, we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. The only thing that counts is faith working through love. Man, what if we just, what if every church on the planet just stopped with this ridiculous set of agendas about what they think they ought to be doing and start living? What if we just stopped and focused all of our energy on living by faith through love? Imagine what kind of fruitfulness would come in our lives. Imagine those who feel like they're far away from God would feel as if maybe they're closer than they thought. And maybe there is hope for them because we're focusing not on our differences and divisions, but we're focusing rather on faith working through love. You were running well, verse 7. Who prevented you from obeying the truth? Such persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. And then skip down to verse 12. I wish those who unsettle you would castrate themselves. That's the best line. He throws more shade in that line than any other passage in the rest of the New Testament. You know, you see what he's doing there? He's like, they're telling you to circumcise yourself. Well, great. That's because they're already circumcised. How about you take the next step? Castrate yourself. That's what work does. Grace says, it's okay. He loves you. We pick up in verse 13. 
For you were all called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become enslaved to one another. What if we cast off every shackle, every bondage? What if we cast off everything that binds us, but we choose to become enslaved by love? I bind myself in love's chains. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. When Paul says you shall love your neighbor as yourself, he's quoting who? Jesus. But when Jesus says it, guess what he's quoting? Leviticus. Keep reading. I'm not kidding. Check it. Now, verse 16, live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh, for what the flesh desires is opposite to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh, for for these are opposed to one another, to prevent you from doing what you want. What do you want? To be fruitful. To be fruitful. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now, watch this. Now, the works of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, uh, impurity, almost says sexual immortality. (laughs) That's a different sermon altogether. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. In other words, yada, yada, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What's he saying? These things are not just bad things we do. That's not what he's saying. These are fruits. These are fruits that grow out of our attempt to find fruit and salvation out of anything other than Jesus. Because when you and I seek to find and develop and make fruit out of anything other than Jesus, we end up frustrated, exhausted, and that's where we end up vulnerable. And in our exhausted, frustrated vulnerability, we seek escape behaviors, and he just named them, drunkenness, carousing, and the things like these. He says, these are fruits that do not give life. I am warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, and here's the money verse, here's the key anchor verse for the entire series. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There is no law against these things. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us be guided by the Spirit. Let us not be conceited, competing against one another, envying one another. And there is the entire sermon that is coming. If we are drawn into the Spirit, guided by the Spirit, let us stay in keeping with the Spirit. That's that's what Paul is saying. That means, Joe, Betty, everything comes from the Spirit living and alive in you. Stop striving to create a life that is impressive like fake fruit on the coffee table in some ant's house. But allow yourself to keep in step with the Spirit and that Spirit will grow fruit in you that you can't help but grow because of not you, but that which is alive in you. And that is where we're going this whole series. And we're going to talk about how we do that. We're going to talk about what do I do literally to remain in the Spirit, to be yielded and surrendered to the Spirit so that I look up and realize, oh, look at what is budding in my life. Love and joy and peace. In fact, do you know what I would do? The first fruit listed in this passage, of course, you know, is love, right? Love, joy, peace, peace. If I could edit the Bible, which God didn't ask me to do, you know what I would do? I'd put a colon after love. For the fruit of the Spirit is love. And everything after love is what comes from love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control comes when we allow the love of God to saturate our minds and hearts and, 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 our, and our living day by day. 
until we become fully mature in that love. And we look up and we are in a garden. We look up and we are a, a fruit basket full of these things that we can't grow in our own, but can grow if he is alive in us. Now, it may be that today you're here today and you're hearing some of the things I'm saying and you're like, I'm so hungry for that kind of fruit and I've tried to feed myself a long time. I've had a bunch of mixed fruit in my life, <laughs> a bunch of mixed fruit, and they've left me hungry at the end of every meal. And I recognize I got to do something different. It might be that today your surrender is a surrender to the love of God and to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It might be that you've given your life to Christ, but you recognize you've been holding on to the controls of life. And maybe today you recognize that it's time for you to truly relinquish the control of your life. Instead of striving, surrender to the power of the Spirit working in you. It may be that you've been doing these things, but you've been so alone in it that you realize that today is the day that you've got to join the fellowship of a body of believers attempting to do the same thing. We've had 53 people within the first five months of this church, of this year, join this church to say, I'm in. I, I see something here that is fruitful and I want to be a part of it. Maybe you're number 54. Maybe today you come forward and you say, I'm in. Whatever the decision, today, allow Christ to move in your heart. You might even pray this way, sitting right where you are. God, I yield myself now, and I recognize, I confess to you that I've not always lived yielded to you. I confess to you that at times I've given lip service to yielding to you, to surrendering to you. But I realize the parts of my life that I've held on to because I'm afraid of true relinquishment, but not anymore. Today, I open my heart to you and I pray that you would do your will within me. And I'm gonna leave the fruit growing up to you. I just want your love to change me beginning even now. And I pray that in the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen. And friends, you may have come today and prayed that prayer, and you may have come to a, a moment where you recognize that the stirring that is going on in your heart is something beyond you. It's something that God has initiated, and you got to do something about it. That's why I invite our pastors to come and stand at the front of the sanctuary here, because at the conclusion of our benediction, when I issue uh, blessings and, and our parting words in just a moment, you are invited to come forward at the conclusion of our service and simply talk to one of us. Come and tell us what it is that God is up to in your life and we'll pray with you and we'll listen to you. We'll hold your hand and patiently, one step at a time. We'll discern what it means for you to take a new step in your faith. Whatever the decision is, don't wait another week. Come today. But now we come to a moment in our worship where it's time for us to, to depart empowered to live in this world, to live outside these walls in such a way that it demonstrates we actually affirm everything that we have confessed inside these walls. So as you're able, would you stand to your feet for the benediction? And my prayer for you, my sisters and my brothers, that you know wherever it is that you go from this place, you know this, the living, breathing Christ will go before you to prepare your way. Christ will go behind you on the days that you fear and feel like retreating to encourage you one step further at a time. Christ will go to your right and Christ to your left, abiding closer than even a sister or a brother. Christ will go above you on the days when dark clouds roll in to remind you there is one above the clouds who at the end of the day has the final word. Christ will go beneath you, girding you with confidence and removing all forms of fear. But mostly Christ will go in you, transforming you from the inside out until your hearts beat in rhythm with his. Amen.